How's your post Thanksgiving going? Oh, well, I, I'm vegan. So we didn't really have a special uh, Thanksgiving or anything like that. We didn't have a turkey. Um, we ate lasagna because my, my family canceled it. <laughs> so it was just me and my wife and my two kids. And we wanted to eat lasagna instead of making a turkey all day. So they ate lasagna and um, yeah, I ate like French fries or something. <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I know my dad's side um, had spaghetti, of all things. Yep. And Tur- turkey is not my favorite thing. Like everyone, I guess it's an American tradition, but once you've lived out of the country, you start to form your own traditions and, and stuff like that. So have you lived out of the country then? Uh, yeah, I went on a, an LDS mission to Spain, uh, Madrid, in the year 2000. Um, and, you know, it changed a lot of perspective about everything when I came home. I really didn't. I'm from Wyoming originally, and I did not like Wyoming. I did not like um, a lot. You know, I missed the cultures and stuff like that. So I moved to Puerto Rico shortly after that and lived in Puerto Rico and met my wife there. So I'd like to say I'm half Puerto Rican, but I, I can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but your kids can, right? <laughs> my kids definitely can. You're like, you guys got what I want. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's cool. I, I know Spain. So I've the furthest out of country I've ever traveled, um, probably Jamaica, Jamaica, Mexico area. Oh, yeah. I love those areas. Caribbean. It's the best. Yeah. Yeah. And I've always wanted to kind of travel over to Europe, like in Spain and, uh, Italy, especially. I think there's a lot of cool oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. There. There's so. just thousands and thousands of years of culture that we just don't have here. You know, people are still. What the, we're, we're holding on to what 200 years of culture you know it's like come on that's nothing no seriously and that's that's what's fascinating too is that like the u.s is so young compared to other countries mm-hmm. like when you put it in that perspective and it's like oh why why is our country so broken right now it's like well we're trying to change and there's people who don't want it to change so <laughs> yep um it's that's that's fascinating though but with spain what kind of food do they eat over there usually uh, their their food is actually kind of bland. Um, they have paella. I don't know if you've heard of paella, which is a rice dish. Um, they have you know shrimp and and they have these things called tortillas. It's just like an egg and potato meal. I mean, it's like a little potato or a egg pie. It's almost like an omelet thing, but not a lot of hot spices, not a lot of of stuff like that. And they have bread for every single meal. And their biggest meal is their lunch, so they can take a siesta which I really enjoyed. I have carried that over to my normal life. Um, but other than that, um, not much else that they, that they eat. Nothing else actually comes to mind. So when they have longer lunches, um, like since they love lunch so much, I should say, like, is it longer than like what it would be here in the U S yeah, traditionally here in the U.S., it's about 30 minutes. There, it's like two and a half hours where you take a lunch and then you take a siesta and, you know, you go home and you you take that time to relax and then you go back to work. So, Well, that sounds nice. <laughs> it is very nice. <laughs> um, and when, when did you move back to the U.S. then? Uh, in 2002. And then I, like three months after being back to the U.S., I went to Puerto Rico. And stayed there for two years until 2003 and a half or 2004. Dude. That's... Long time ago. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was like in elementary then. So, yeah, yeah, it feels long for me. It probably feels a lot longer for you. That's okay, young guy. That's, that's not it's on an age joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, let's have you introduce yourself so we could put a face to the, the voice oh, of well, okay. watching this. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Cody Newton. I'm actually a filmmaker out of Boise, Idaho. I've done a lot of work in Utah, though, and made a lot of connections with people in Utah. Um, and so that's why I'm on this podcast with Chaz. I've seen his movie, and I just won the award that he won uh, recently at the Utah Film Awards, which is best short film or best film under a $500 budget. Uh, yeah. Dude, that's a feat. 
<laughs> it is a feat because it it takes a lot more work and you know it's one thing to throw money at something and get a good product out but it's another thing to really put in the sweat equity and find people who are passionate about doing it and it's not about the money and well, so we were happy about winning that award yeah congrats on your on your win that's huge <laughs> yeah. um but i i just got off set of the chosen where i was an accounting clerk of all things because I did not grow up a, you know, filmmaker. I always wanted to go to film school, but I never thought it was an actual thing I could do. Um, so I got my MBA and my master's in business administration and started my own business. And once I started making money, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do what I've always wanted to do, which is make movies. So I started making movies. So does having a master's uh, in, in what was a business you said? Business administration. Yeah. Business administration. Now, does that like help you with like producing stuff since that's all about the money you would think? Not at all. Like just financially spending your stuff and, and, and taking care of those things. That'll help you more than, than actually going and reading a textbook and learning about business. You know, that's more of the, the office work and, 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 managing people and, and all of those different things. So I never credit my, my MBA for anything that I'm doing in film other than <laughs> maybe uh, messing up on, on my taxes because they didn't teach me enough about doing taxes. It, oh, they did not teach you about taxes. No, no, it was just like one class and it just, it's so important that, that technically, yeah, I should have a CPA or I should have an accountant do it. But when you're broke, <laughs> you have to do it yourself. Yeah, no, I've I've been there. I, I I think last year I did TurboTax for the first time on my own. Yeah, and essentially I got started in filmmaking because I messed up on my taxes, and I I ran my own business buying and selling iPhones for a living. I did it for five years, and I did like two million in sales from my garage um, in 2015. But then I paid so much money in taxes that I thought, okay, I need to start doing something that I actually want to do. Because, I mean, that's kind of the secret. That's what, that's what capitalism, you know, is. is it, or those people want to be able to spend their money the way they want and get it written off. And so um, I made a feature film as a tax write-off in 2017 with my family. And it was just kind of a fun family movie, you know. It's with our kids. And it was my nephew who's my best friend. He came up and we shot for 10 days on my phone. And I learned Premiere and I learned After Effects and I learned everything that way while, you know, writing it off <laughs> at the same time. I even put my business name in the title of the movie. So, <laughs> so, so you shot the whole feature on a, on a phone. Yeah, it was the Samsung V. No, not Samsung. It was LG, LG V10 because it could shoot 24 frames a second. Wow. Yeah. And it was so rough. It was so, but... We enjoyed it. The kids really enjoyed it. I mean, it's about a ninja cowboy and a Viking. Um, it's like Goonies meets, meets the Avengers type of thing. And it's just fight scene after fight scene after fight scene. But it was a good 10 days, but it took me about a thousand hours to edit and, and get that thing ready for a theater. Whew. The man, like shooting something on a phone, nonetheless, and yeah. then learning to edit as you go on that. That's cool. And it's a feature film too. It's not like just like a fun little it's short. It's 90 a minutes long. Yeah. We thought it was going to be about 40 minutes, but man, it just, it kept going. <laughs> so what, what inspired that idea then? So in, in college, when I was getting my MBA with my nephew, um, we made a series of short films for our family called the adventures of Ninja Cowboy, where I was the ninja. My nephew was the cowboy. And when our kids watched it in, in 2015, I think is when they watched it. They said, dad, we want to make a movie. And I was like, man, I haven't, I haven't made a movie in a long time. And I kind of got out of filmmaking because I didn't have the money to put into like the computer was the big thing. Like trying to edit on a laptop with this new HD format and stuff like that. I was like, it's actually an investment. And I just didn't have the money to do that. In 2015, I had the money. So first thing I did is I bought a huge computer to like a gaming computer and uh, had to learn Premiere and all that stuff. We made like three short films as tests before, and I was like, okay, let's, let's do it. But making it for an audience is different than making it for just, you know, family, stupid YouTube stuff. 
Yeah. When, so when did you start filmmaking then? Like when did you kind of go in that path? So 2016 is when we made the movie. It released in 2017 when I finally finished it. Um, we released it in three different theaters and actually raised money for make a wish with it. So it raised $25,000, which is three wishes for kids. And it was at that first showing that I, I mean, before I, I even went out there, because there's about 300 people in that theater watching that movie I've been working on for a thousand hours, you know, this stupid family movie. Uh, I knew that this is where I was supposed to be. I knew this is what I was supposed to become. And it's, it has always been there. I just never took the risk. And now I, I did. So in 2017 is, is really when I, I flipped that switch and said, okay, I'm a filmmaker now and I'm going to try and do this professionally. I think it's so cool though, that you donated all the money to, to a cause, you know? Yeah. Well, most of the people are probably there to, for make a wish because um, one of my nephew's kids who plays the Viking in the movie, he is a make a wish kid. Uh, he had a surgery when he was four. And so they sent him to Disney world and they had a, a fun experience there. So it's their way of giving back, but it seemed like it was a perfect opportunity to have people, you know, watch this, this stupid movie, but at the same time, do something good with it. Yeah. Is that movie um, available for like general public, like on YouTube? Or? <laughs> it's on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's called Ninja Cowboy Viking versus the Gadget Gents, which is my business name. Uh, but like I said, it was, on. well, here's the thing. I didn't know there was anybody in my community that made films that did anything. You know, I, I did, I thought it was all LA. Um, and right before the movie released, I started meeting some of these people who were just as passionate as I was, you know, my tribe. And th they gave me suggestions of what like camera I should buy and, and, and things like that. So I went out and bought an Ursa Mini Pro because they just came out, I think. And like I said, it was just a tax write-off. Um, and so I started my business with that, trying to learn camera. I didn't, I didn't even know what Aperture was in 2017. Um, but I quickly learned and I tried to get on as many sets as I could. And there's, there's so many fun people here and it's not quite like Utah where there is an industry there. There's a big tax incentive, lots of things coming um, here. It's just, it's just us. And if there's a big thing that comes in, there's only a few people who actually work on it. So it, we're almost like, like literal family here where we're always checking in on each other and, and just making stuff for fun on the weekends under $500 to go win awards. <laughs> um, and how was, how was this year's festival? Um, I was, I was unable to go, but I, it's all virtual, right? Yeah, it was all virtual, which is, it makes me so sad because it's, it's such a fun experience to go meet those people and then watch their movies and then, you know, cheer for them after in the credits and, and yeah. things like that. So uh, I'm excited for next year. We have several we're going to be submitting um, for next April. And hopefully one of them takes, who knows? You never know with them. Um, but I, I love, I mean, I love that whole dress up and have it be just a big memory for everyone in the cast and crew and, and to go win together is, is such a big deal. And it was, it was kind of sad that we were just kind of, you know, sitting in the office separate saying, Hey, okay, we won. Awesome. <laughs> Great. You know, there's no, no pictures or no dressing up or no anything like that. And my son, who was actually in the movie, was nominated for Best Young Actor also. And so when we were planning on going in April, it was like, oh, man, this is going to be fun. We got to get him a tuxedo and all this fun stuff. But were, you, were you nominated didn't for happen. anything else? No, nope, that was it. See, that's another thing we had in common. Uh, Emily was nominated for Best Lead Actress. <laughs> no, there you go. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't win that, unfortunately. But I think, yeah, dude, $500. I kind of want to do it again with a low budget. Like, I don't want money like i feel like if i had money i'd waste it you know like well that, that's the thing is like we would have got the same outcome if we had you know five ten fifty thousand dollars would have been the same movie it's just yeah. people would have come out of it uh, with a little more money yeah i had this um i took this class in college i don't, don't remember what it was specifically but it was basically making argument visual rhetoric that's what it's called visual rhetoric so you'd make arguments using pictures and graphs and try to like state your point that way. And I had to present um, about films uh, because that was more of my major. Like I, I, I graduated with a BFA in film and media arts, but awesome. um, 
for that class, I'm like, I, I, I wanted to talk about low budget films compared to like huge Hollywood films, you know, and I talked about Blumhouse, how their budgets are like five million to three million, which is low budget on the on the Hollywood spectrum. To us, that's not low budget. I mean, that's like yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. But uh, if you're looking at the Hollywood spectrum, that's what they consider low budget. And my my idea was that uh, the lower budget you have, the more creative freedom you have because you're forced to be more creative to pull off certain stuff. And that, that's kind of a fun, kind of a fun philosophy to kind of enforce, you know, like practice with essentially. Uh, so I, I like well, low budget stuff. What I like about the low budget stuff is it's not, you know, it's not about the business side of it. It's not them going to focus group and saying, okay, well, what do you want to see? Oh, we want to see another heist movie. Okay. We'll do a heist movie with kids or whatever. Yeah. You know, it, it, it is one person has a vision. They want to see that vision through. And you really get to enter into like the genuine heart of, of another person. And that, that kind of comes out in some of my movies recently where I felt, I felt like we were trying, we were actually really getting better and we were really doing our craft well. And um, I recently did a movie called no daddy daughter dance. That is literally just my heart on, on screen. Um, and it was so close to me that uh, I acted in it and my daughter was in it because it's kind of, it's about us. And I knew that character was me. So I, I just had to be in it. And I had some, there were some insert shots of um, her growing up with me in it that I had to have in there. So I don't usually go out after the acting thing because I don't cuss. Uh, I, there's some, you know, there's some lines I won't cross. And I crossed a couple of them when I, when I was acting um, early on and it, it hurt hurt some relationships. It's, uh, it wasn't great for me. So I knew that's, I, I can't really go on that path when it's like, Hey, I need an actor for this script. Oh, well, is there any cussing? Is there any uh, kissing of women or sex? Or I mean, you can't really do that when it's like, okay, this is your vision. You can do your, what you want. Yeah. And it, I, you know, it kind of takes away from the craft of acting if I can't not be myself. So, yeah, we took our, there's a class um, screenwriting class I took and all the writers would essentially kind of ask, you know, like before I handing out the parts, like, are you okay with, you know, swearing? Are you okay with this content? Yeah. And um, Utah, you have to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people were actually cool with saying no. And there were some like, once they got a gist of how the writer writes, because I mean, there's like a lot of dark messed up scripts in that class. <laughs> um, they would have to step out until that table read was done. And then they'd come back in. But it was never disrespectful, and the writers never took it as a disrespect. You know, it was always, I don't know, just respecting the craft, essentially. And that's, and that's good. I mean, everyone can. I mean, that's the thing is, like, they aren't essentially judging you. They are just, they, they're keeping yep. themselves to a standard. And so as long as there's not any judgment going on. Like, I, I won't act in something, but, yeah, I, I went and I shot um, a Friday the 13th fan film. Uh, it was a whole feature film and there was, there was nudity and blood. I mean, there's like 40 kills in that thing. And I had such a fun time. I said, I was like, uh, you know, and, and so I'm fine with that, but it's, it's when I'm acting that it's, it's, it's just, it's not for me, I guess. Yeah. There's, there's something about it. I got, um, so, uh, the, the way you and I kind of know each other mutually is probably through Landon. I would imagine, mm -hmm. um, I got him to drop the F bomb <laughs> in my short film. Yeah. I, t and I told him he didn't have to, because I knew, you know, uh, it, Landon's a nice guy and he's like, okay, I, I won't. But then I think he realized it didn't sound right. And so he just went for it without even telling us. And like, so hearing him drop it, I was just like, <laughs> thank you. Number yeah. one, but also, <laughs> yeah, well, if it's true to the character, I mean, then, then he should. My problem is a lot of the, a lot of these people writing scripts, they are not true to the character. They're just like, yeah, yeah. They're, they're writing something. Oh, they're, they're angry. So let's, he's saying 15 F words here. Like how many times have I ever heard someone cuss like that in my life? I mean, never, you know, uh, and, and it's okay to use them generously, but, but just have a purpose behind them. Um, yeah. And, there, and there's times um, like when I'm writing, like you said, when you're angry or whatever, and like 
uh, before we started recording, you know, I was like, uh, I, I casually drop stuff <laughs> a lot more often yeah. than I probably should. But even hearing stuff out loud in my scripts um, during table reads, I'm like, that does not sound natural, you know, cross that out kind of a thing and fix it. But um, yeah, I'm true to the character. Like everything has to kind of have intent. Like you said, mm-hmm. I think that's the biggest takeaway too, is like, if there's no intent behind it, then like, why Yeah, do it? You know, and it's kind of like, kind of like why we're kind of pursuing the craft is because like, like what's our intention with it, you know? And I think we could both be on the mutual grounds of being like, we love filmmaking. Like we love the craft of filmmaking. 100%. Yes. But the other thing is I do like, I, I love the experience with the audience and I, I traditionally want my audience to be as big as possible. So if I throw in, you know, apparently you're allowed like four F words in a PG 13, but usually it's one, you know, if you put in four F words, it's, there goes your audience. You know, you have half your audience now because children can't watch it. Families can't become unified more. You know, I went to go watch Jaws with my kids during this whole COVID crisis and, what what an amazing experience and what a fun time to share with my kids, you know, uh, if if that if it would have been rated R type of thing, even though it is a monster movie, it's a horror movie. Uh, if it would have had F words in it left and right, I wouldn't have been able to have that experience with my kids. So I just kind of keep that in mind as I create my stuff. Um, and that is my reasoning behind it. It's not just like, oh, well, I'm religious. You know, I've actually really thought this through. And yeah, and it's just that's that line I won't cross. Yeah, well, I think that's another thing, you know, like when you are writing or when you're trying to create something, it's like, well, who is this for aside from yeah. ourselves, you know, because I think every piece that you touch, it's going to have a personal touch to it anyway, um, in some yeah. form. And so, it's, like you said, you kind of want a bigger audience in there. You want to see people see your talent, you know, like it's that is I think that is a thing that all artists kind of strive for is not to be like well known, but just for other people to kind of relate to them through art, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I, I think, I don't, I don't think it's ever um, a bad thing to kind of question who your audience is. And I think a lot of times, like for me, especially um, when I'm writing, I don't tend to think about that too often, like on my first draft, just because oh, yeah. I get stuck, like, oh my God, this has to be for them. You know, like this has to be for whatever, but it's as you kind of fine tune the, the script and the draft, it kind of finds its own voice and you kind of recognize who the audience is for, or who, who it's for. And then you can kind of fine tune it more into that direction on rewrites. And then you can kind of know what you're making. Yeah. So absolutely. Uh, how, how long so do you write scripts then as well? Are you a writer? I do. I, I'm not like, I'm not a writer like, Hey, every morning I'm going to wake up at 5.00 AM and, and write for <laughs> six hours, that type of thing. No, I mean, I have a book full of ideas and those ideas turn into more. And then, I start writing when it's time to work on the next project and I like writing, but it's just not, you know, it's not my end all be all. So when, when you write though, do you ever like outline your stories? I don't outline. I do the story clock. Um, the story clock helps me so much. Um, do you know what the story clock is? I, I don't, I, I might have an idea of it, but like what's, what's going to deets. <laughs> I wish well, I have a book right here. Let's see if a story clock is in here. Um, so essentially, it's just laying out how long your movie is in clock form. Oh, right here. Uh, so you write, you write it out in clock form, right? And this movie is supposed to be 20 minutes long. And so I start here and say, oh, this guy shows that he has a new pair of shoes. It's really exciting. Um, and then, you know, I'm looking in the mirror here. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> You're good. Um, so at the beginning, he talks about his shoes and then this happens, you know, an assassin tries to kill him, but he's in love with the assassin, uh, blah, 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 blah. So it, it's easy to make connections this way because I know the big points that I want to make, right? Uh, he falls in love with an assassin. Woo, I, I can't point here. He falls in love with an assassin. Um, she tries to kill him. Another, a cop, tries to protect him and then later on but what the story clock does is if i mention shoes here all i do is i come across over here to like this right before the end of the uh, second act and i can reference those shoes again because it's almost like an inside joke and it happens everywhere it's it's, it set up some payoffs (gasps) so that's how i do my outlines um 
so that everything has context. You know, if I'm going to make a joke later in the thing and I have information that's not prepared for that, I know to go to the other side and, and prepare that joke or prepare that idea or prepare that, you know, and that's, that's an easy way to make sure that you're showing and not telling or else you have to like just throw an exposition of why that's important to this character or whatnot. I love um, that. I've, I actually have never thought about that. Um, Dan Harmon, who's the creator for community and Rick and Morty, he has a, circle. Yeah. yeah, that's that. That's what they kind of reminded me of was. And that's kind of, and it's very similar, but this is more like the, the fine details of it. The story circle is for um, just finding the conflict for your character and, and where he goes. And, and yeah, every movie kind of has to follow that. Yeah. Um, but this one, this is, because a lot of my movies are comedies. There's a lot of funny stuff about them, but even in horrors, because I've done horrors recently also, understanding when they look at something and why they're scared of it, I mean, that has to be set up beforehand. And ideally, it's not just like right beforehand. It's something that's been brewing for a little bit. So most of my outlines are not like that. I like to see where my characters go, but I know they have to hit certain, uh, certain spots in that story um, clog. Dude, that's such a cool idea. Like, <laughs> I'm like, kind of like, my gears are turning now where I'm like, oh my God, if I did that for this yeah. script, I wouldn't like be struggling like, with this other scene. <laughs> yeah, and it really helps you. Like, uh, dialogue is, is the hardest for a lot of people because they want it to sound natural and they want it to sound right, um, yeah. like the character. You know, I just watched a movie. I watched a movie last night, Death Proof, is a uh, Tarantino film. And I struggled so much because every single woman in that movie just sounded like Tarantino. And, and, and I was, it was just talking and talking and talking for 45 minutes and then like a second of action. And I was like, man, the pacing of this is really bad. It's like, and I really <laughs> struggled with it. Yeah. Very similar, but, but worse to me. Um, plus it's a second part of a feature of a double feature. And I really like the first of planet terror. That's with Robert Rodriguez, right? Yeah. That one's just because, when, when you're on set and you see the special effects that it takes to do all that stuff, I, I kind of geek out about it. I mean, just, just the, the big squibs when somebody's shot, I'm like, man, <laughs> I'm not to that point. I wish I could get to that point. Cause that'd be really cool. Dude, I think there's so much behind the scenes stuff. Like I was um, watching, well, I was watching fast and the furious of all things, which one last, last night, the first one it's on HBO. Okay. Um, I watched the second one after as well. It was the second one. It was the second one that I had this thought. Um, they're in a club, and I, I don't know why they were there, but uh, they're in a the club, and just like hearing the music in the background, I'm like, that's added in post. And then hearing you know all the chatters, I'm like that's added in post. Yep. So, and like why like people question like well, how do they get such good dialogue? It's because it, all the extras in there are fake talking. It's dead quiet except for the actors. And it's probably the most awkward thing. Yeah. It's probably the most awkward thing to film and to act out because it's, it's the editing where the magic comes to life where it, where it gets sold. So I think there's like so many fun hidden stuff where it's like, Oh yeah, that's actually not that crazy. Like it seems like that loud. Like it seems. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And a lot of that, that stuff, I think there, in general, there, there's a, more of an interest in, in how films are made uh, because there's so much information on YouTube and whatnot. And so uh, it's harder to hide those things from people, uh, especially things like uh, I use a lot of haze and smoke in, in my films. And I mean, I just haze it up like crazy. And when you go in there, it's like, man, who is smoking so much in this, in this movies? It's like, no, it's just, come on, settle down. And everyone's just thinking about that haze machine in the corner or whatnot, <laughs> you know, and even when, uh, when people are lighting, you know, they, they're like, well, what's this light motivated by? And it's like, come on, are you serious? Like, it's just a backlight. Just let it be a backlight. No <laughs> one's going to think about that. But most people are, are now able to think, oh, it's lit this way. Or they, they recognize the craft behind the movie more than just, oh, the story is this and the actors are doing this. Yeah, well, it's like I, I'm not the biggest fan of. Um, okay, let me rephrase that. I'm not the most knowledgeable of lighting at all. Like, I think that's sound and lighting are like two classes I wish I did take during college, but I did not. Those would be some of the most important ones in indie filmmaking for sure. 
Yeah, I, I took more of like the writing stuff and the producing and directing. But the um, watching movies now, it's always fun, especially if like being on set after being on set and like helping all the grip and like you know uh, gaffing and stuff. Mm-hmm. Recognizing, oh, that's a hair light. Like <laughs> there's something above them, directly above them, and like it's it's to make it look neat and that the average viewer, they're not going to exactly see that hairline, you know, like <laughs> and, they don't think about it at all. So it's, and that's why it's important to what you do because ideas are what's different. Um, that's not something that you're just going to be able to just process and make easy. It's not just a science to it. It's there's a lot of creativity to it. Uh, so I'm definitely to that point right now where I'm trying to develop ideas and establish myself as an idea factory more than just, Oh, I can make pretty images with my camera, you know, just because I think that's more important to to this day and age. So what do you hope to get out of pursuing filmmaking as a whole then? Well, I mean, ultimately, I want to support my family doing something I love. Um, if I can't make money doing it, then I will have to go drive for Amazon or do something else. Um, currently, I do have my own um, production company, so I'm able to help clients and, and businesses and, and people getting married have wedding videos and stuff like that. I'm able to support my family this way, but ultimately I want to be able to make feature films and create a, not only business for myself, but a business for my family and, and help people come together by watching these movies. So with weddings and stuff, um, what, like, how long have you been doing weddings and like the freelance stuff? Just Since 2017. So no, I, I dropped that other business and just started doing video production. So have you like recently revisited like your earlier stuff and compared yeah. to like? <laughs> I was I was actually to do a you know indie filmmakers react to their old stuff. Because I've been watching some, even just the coloring on some of my old weddings or or my old projects. Like I said, I didn't even know what Aperture was in 2017. And I mean, that's only three years ago. And now I've, I've DP'd features. I've, I've done a lot of stuff with the camera and it's, it's phenomenal to me how much you can learn in so little time with, with willing people who help you um, as you fail. And, And that's kind of what we did with as up here. With all of our films, we just gave our chance to a chance to fail, you know. Yeah, I mean, if you're not failing, you're not making progress. Exactly. I I think you should do that video. I think that'd be really fun to kind of watch, especially like if you because if it's your reaction, like I'm pretty sure all filmmakers would be like, "Oh my god, I know exactly what he's thinking," <laughs> and then showing the two products together will sh- like shows how much your talents kind of you know broadened mm-hmm. and increased. So. But you had talked about like a boom shadow in a night of adventure, you know, even just something <laughs> little like that. And that's something so small. Nobody ever is noticing that if you didn't notice it for that long, don't worry about it too much. You know? Yeah. But, I, didn't, I didn't notice that until like what my 30th time watching it when, it, since it's been out probably, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, I think it was actually during the, um, what was it? The one story, one community uh, streaming stuff that Michael did. And that's when I first noticed it. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, seriously, 30 times the other people aren't. Let it be an Easter egg. I always say that. Yeah, it's an Easter egg. Yeah, I mean, the Mandalorian, um, not the latest episode, which is great, by the way, but the episode before that. Are you caught up on it? By I'm chance? only on episode one. I've been in Utah, so I've, I want to watch it with my family. Uh, of the second season? Yeah. Okay, there, there's an episode, I think it's episode three. Um, where there's a nice little cameo from a crew member. <laughs> oh, oh, I saw that. It's behind Apollo Creed, Carl Weathers. Yeah. <laughs> He's just standing there. Yeah. I saw a meme about that. You got to love that about Facebook. You get to experience stuff before you watch it. Yeah. I, I love it. It's also, it's kind of fun too. Um, I've been watching a gross amount of impractical jokers. Oh yeah. Cause it's on HBO max. And it's thinking about oh, how are you going to set up these hidden cameras? How are these people not seeing these people with cameras, you know? And then yeah. sometimes you'll get shots of the crew members in them and you're like, Oh, they're hidden. 
Like they yeah. are like dressed up to a T and like you can't really tell unless you like focus, you know. I think it's fun. There's so much stuff you get away with in film. There's a lot of stuff you can get away with. I mean, Borat. Borat just came out and I'm just going, how are these real people? There's no way that these are real people. There's no way. It seems like they just have a camera right in their face and then they just made them sign a release. Like how? I have no idea how they even make that movie. I don't either. I mean, I, have you seen the new one? Yes. <laughs> so like the, the where he's staying with those guys for like what, five days or whatever. I'm yeah. Like, how, how do you pull that off? I, I read that he stayed in character for five days, but it's just how, wild. How are they planting cameras in there? Is it, that's their house, right? I don't know. I don't know. That's weird, right? <laughs> it is weird. And it almost seems like it's impossible to make it authentic. Unless they're just saying, Hey, we're following around this guy. You don't know who Borat is, I guess. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I guess I've done that before where it said, Hey, we're making a, a film, sign this release. And on the release, it says, Oh, we're allowed to use this for good or for bad. But they never care about that. And print. <laughs> <laughs> well and like that's i think that's my biggest criticism of the second borat is i kind of wanted to see more of like how they came up with the ideas and how they executed it rather than like trying to push this fake narrative already yeah <laughs> the narrative was a little too strong the first borat it was just kind of a fun let's imagine if it was a fish out of the water guy you know in yeah. america and that's that's fun to explore the second borat it was just <laughs> it's almost exploiting America's niceness where it's like, hey, make me a cake that says I hate Jews. Oh, okay. What color do you want? You know, because people don't want to ever be that person that says, no, I don't want to be the, but, but maybe we should, you know, maybe that's what the, what it's exploring. Yeah. Yeah. I, I watched that with a family. It was kind of interesting. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, it, it, it made me feel embarrassed for everyone involved. I'm glad I watched it alone because watching it with other people, it would just be like, oh, too uncomfortable. Yeah, especially the ballroom dance scene. Um, oh, my goodness. See, looking at uh, family's faces during that scene, and they were repulsed, you know, like, yeah, what the hell is this? so? Yeah, what did I get into? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think, I don't know, it kind of goes for like, um, kind of dives into like a different sub genre of independent films though, which is mumblecore. Do you know what mumblecore is? I don't. So it's essentially like super, 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 super low budget. I mean, like our $500 films could be mumblecore um, ish, but the, the difference is that it doesn't have like a set script. It's all based off like improv acting. Oh, okay. And um, there's a movie called drinking buddies, which by Joe Swanberg, and it's one of my favorite indie films. Is that but, with Mark Duplass? Is yes, that Duplass brothers. Uh, he, I think Mark Duplass might be. In, no, it's what's his name? Hold on, I'll look it up real quick. Searching. I think I've heard about it. Anna Kendrick's in it. Um, Olivia Wilde's in it. Jake Johnson, Ron Livingston. I, that's who I thought was Mark Dupl- Duplass. Um, no. Uh. He is not in it then. Nope. Ron, Ron Livingston. But uh, I think the budget, does it say the budget on here? See, the budget was like $1 million, but the oh. only made 300000 in the box office. You know, you win some, you lose some. <laughs> but this is it's an improv film? Yeah. So what, how they set it up was um, the director would give the actors the scenes, like the beats they needed to hit, essentially. Oh, yeah. But they would come up with the dialogue and with the pacing oh wow and so a lot of the so shots are kind of like these. yeah well a lot of the shots are kind of like long takes but um there's some po- like i don't know there's i feel like it's almost experimental because it's trying to get the raw emotion mm-hmm. out you know so i kind of always admired that kind of approach i, I could see it i mean it's almost i mean in, in my movies in some ways are kind of like that you know you want to be able to let your actor take your character where they feel like they want to go and then you just kind of yeah. you know guide them through those things but never like that where it's just like you make up all the dialogue that's that's pretty crazy that is crazy and like ugh, just like i wonder like how much prep went into it you know like did, did they let them know like a week before so they could kind of 
plan for it or it was just like the day of shooting like here's what needs to happen merry christmas you know <laughs> yeah i don't know because i kind of feel like the office you know is kind of like done that way where it, it, is everything scripted oh, or did they, they had to let them riff right because office is hilarious and i don't think it would have been the same if people were just because it's hard to be able to really come up with that stuff sitting at a keyboard if yeah. when you're there and you're the, you know, when you are the actor and you are that character, it's, it's so much easier to just say, well, I, you know, I'm noticing that, or I'm noticing that, or I'm thinking about that. Yeah. Well, I know Judd Apatow, um, he, I was listening to his masterclass, but he's, I think he said, uh, that if you're going to do improv in that sort, you kind of want to have multiple cameras running 24 oh, yeah. seven. And that way you could use reactions from different takes that aren't related to what they're actually saying, but it still fits in editing. <laughs> that makes and, sense. Yeah. And there's, he said, I think it's like up to maybe 10 or 15 different jokes per, um, what do you want to call it? Like per camera position before they kind of move it around. But I think that'd be fun. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that would be fun. I did a movie kind of like that in February. It was a three camera shoot about, you know, six friends sitting around a, a Google home <laughs> and the Google starts to kind of spill their beans about their search histories and stuff like that. Um, so, but it was very improv. It was like, all right, Google's going to say this. What do you, what do you think your character would, how they would react or what they would do? <laughs> and so I didn't come in with any like preconceived notions of how it would go other than this is the conflict. Now you figure out what uh, the solution is. <laughs> and yeah. And I think like, I'm not an actor either, but like, I think that'd be kind of a fun challenge to take on, you know, if you're in the right mindset, if you're, if you're in the mindset to be able to give your all to it. Yes. If it's just like, Hey, I was supposed to be here for three hours and then you're not really thinking about it very long. And you don't have that time to really get into character, then no, it's, it's not going to work <laughs> a lot of the time. And it, it depends on the actors. I've had a lot of actors is like, wait, we don't have a script or there. I, I don't know what the words are here. And I'm like, yeah, just figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. I've also worked with some who've tried to say word by word in the dialogue. And then that's when you're like, I wrote that weird. Yeah. Say it how you'd normally say it. Make it your own. <laughs> yep. As long, and I think um, that was actually a note um, that I gave quite a bit, actually, and I have a venture. Um, I'll just say kind of, this is the point that you're trying to make, but like, however you bring it up, feel free. Like that's, mm -hmm. this is a blueprint. You're bringing it to life. Like, <laughs> so I think it's always a fun approach. I like making movies. I like writing. I miss making movies, dude. I haven't made anything since being in COVID. I am so sorry. Do you have anything lined up? I mean, I've got a couple feature drafts done, like first drafts. So they're not like oh, wow. anything spectacular. That's the crap draft, you know, but I want to. I Once quarantine's lifted, I, I, my goal is to like have something completely finished and fine tuned. So that way, once it's lifted, it's like a like water from like being released from a dam, you know, like full force. Yeah, go. And I kind of thought that also once lockdown started, I was like, oh, I, I'm going to have time to write all these features and, and do all that stuff. And then one weekend it, it stopped. <laughs> I was just like, well, I'm living in my pajamas and I guess I'll play video games all day. Um, <laughs> you know, but I had a goal this year to make a short every single month. And we, we actually did it. Um, but I am very quick. So most of the time we're only shooting one day, maybe a day and a half. And then I go home and edit um, in the next two days and have a, a done movie. So, so are these shorts, are they all online? They're all online. They're Cody. on Amazon or YouTube or wherever. Cody's just killing it. <laughs> He's just going fast. Well, I'm, I'm trying to refine my team and, and be able to get to that point where number one, we're ready to be given money to make a feature, yeah. but then when we're given money, have the ability to, to make it. So I didn't want, I didn't want to stop that goal. And 
most of the time I was doing it with my family and with um, another family that I, you know, I trusted. So we had been essentially doing everything together anyway. So mm-hmm. if, if we were going to catch COVID, we were going to catch it together. But on some of them, I had my 14 year old son pulling focus for me, you know, that type of stuff, <laughs> uh, doing sound and, and, and whatnot. And we never had more than like seven crew members on set. So uh, that's, I think it's always fun to find some, um, like the less crew that you have, the more you're like, okay, you're going to be doing this. And they're like, I don't know how, but you're going to learn. <laughs> you're going to learn. Cause it's, you know, it's not that hard to press a button and run sound, but to, to do it well. Yeah. It, it is a craft. Yeah. I remember my first time running sound was actually, um, so my 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 cousin was shooting some like he wasn't shooting he was acting in something and the director let me come on to be like pa and you know, help out yeah but it was my first time actually being like on a set that big and they wanted me to run sound and i kept really dropping, i kept dropping the the boom mic in the the shot oh no <laughs> and the the ad had to come over and he's like one of I want a better technique. I'm like, yeah. And he's like, hold it kind of like, you know, like this, your arms won't get tired. Oh, but mm-hmm. since then I've, I've always hated sound. That's the only reason I made a, a short appearance in, in that adventure was because we needed a, a, somebody on to play this character. That's like a total side character at the last second. And is there me or the sound guy? And I'm like, I hate sound. So <laughs> That's why you took it. Okay. Yep. <laughs> I actually like sound because I like directing and I like to be, there's an intimacy with sound where oh, you for can sure. really experience the emotions, even like the little like breaths that they take or gas or you experience every little thing and you're right in there on every single scene. Um, so I like I definitely like this experience it with the actors because it helps me as a director also. So, okay. So I haven't reached um, this level of filmmaking yet. Like, always seeing directors having the headphones, you know? Yeah. Is that, is that to hear the dialogue essentially? Yes. Yes. Okay. It's essentially like they have video village. They want to be able to watch it um, because the director needs to experience it. I mean, he's trying to experience the movie first. Uh, You can't really do that. You can't hear it. So most of the time you have the, um, I forget what they call it, the IFB or whatever. Um, And and it's just a, a lavalier mic receiver i mean that's all that that they're sending to the director and and they're literally experiencing the movie as as they went you know i think that's cool i always thought that like the second i reached that where i could be like (laughs) just just wear headphones (laughs) (laughs) i thought i think it'll be always fun or like the having the viewfinder like (laughs) (laughs) that's right do you direct, uh, I mean, away from the actor? I mean, you're right next to the actors, next to the camera. I'm right next to the right? camera watching the, the DP usually, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the best place for me. I On The Chosen, the director was like way off in, in the video village around the corner or whatever. And I was like, oh, I, I, I don't think I could do that. I want to see things as they happen. I want to experience it in person with them. Yeah, well, it's kind of, I don't know. I, I like being that close. Uh to them and plus i feel like if i'm like this isn't digging on anybody but me personally i feel like if i'm always sitting down i feel like i'm not doing enough work <laughs> that's and, true <laughs> and so like i like to be there and then i also like to not watch the camera 24 7 on the first few takes it's just to watch their actions you know essentially and like see if anything could be fine-tuned then have them ch- kind of change it and then look at the camera and see if that looks any better or whatever but um, I recently, so I upgraded my TV and I put my TV that I upgraded from in my bedroom where I had a smaller TV, but that smaller TV, I just hooked it up to my DSLR um, through the HDMI. And oh, yeah. I, this is my first time finding out that like there's a mini HDMI, like that's how like <laughs> tech savvy I am. But seeing the the picture on the smaller screen from my camera, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can use this on shoots now. <laughs> like I, yes, I don't have can. to sit by the camera and like breathe down the cinematographer's neck. <laughs> yeah. So what, one of the first things I bought after I bought my camera was a follow focus and a 
transmitter because I knew that's how Hollywood did it. I knew autofocus was an option. I knew pulling my own focus was the worst. <laughs> so I, I never, I never go on set without some kind of transmitter anymore just because I want everyone to experience it with us. I've been on those sets where there's one viewfinder well, there's one person experiencing it, you know. If you have makeup there, you want to make sure they're looking cuz I'm not going to look at what their hair looks like. I'm not going to look at, you know, any kind of like shiny stuff on their face. That's, you know, not my job. <laughs> but other people can do it. And HDMI is the easiest way to do that for sure. Yeah, well, like I I vlog every now and then, so I thought that'd be kind of cuz um I have a 5D Mark 4, and so it doesn't have like a pull out screen that I yeah. can look at. So I've had to use my phone because I could do it off that, but it's such a pain in the butt. And so now I have this smaller and like this TV is like 12 years old. Like it's an old school Vizio essentially, but it's HD. And um, I see there's like four screws in the back of it. I'm like, that's going to be mounted on like a little stand. Oh yeah. I'm going to buy I an extension cord idea. for it. Yeah. I don't, I got like, it's, it's oddly exciting seeing how you can still utilize old technology for film. <laughs> mm -hmm. I had like a hundred foot HDMI cable for my old like theater room also. So you could put that anywhere like that. Yeah. I love, and HDMIs are so like readily available everywhere. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. You can buy it for like $9. Yeah. It's kind of ridiculous, but um, yeah, I had to buy a converter though for the HDMI mini. But now that I know it's a thing. Now you know. Now I know. And now you're that much better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it makes it look more professional, even though it's just like a new found technique, I guess, if you want to call 100%. it. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, okay, just th this is kind of off topic, but is there a movie that you kind of watched that got you m wanting to be in film, like when you were younger? Uh oh, did you cut um, out? You are breaking up a little bit. What'd you say? Oh, that's probably my internet. Sorry. Uh, did you, like when you were younger, did you watch a movie that kind of um, inspired you to get into film? Oh, yeah. yeah. A little movie called Rumble in the Bronx. Um, you know, I was, I was like 13 years old and I, we weren't really allowed to watch rated R movies, but my older brother, who was my nephew's dad, you know, um, we were out on a trip or something like that. And he said, Oh, you have to see this movie and rumble in the Bronx just changed my life because it wasn't like, I don't know. It wasn't like a crazy, like Terminator two or anything like that. It was just one guy doing stunts like crazy. And it's just doing fight choreography. And, and I mean, obviously I fell in love with Jackie Chan and started watching all of his movies. And, and to this day, he's my favorite film director because he directed a lot of his own stuff. Um, but that was that was the one that said, "Hey, you could, you should do this at home." And so that's what we started doing. I started making movies with my family at home, like Jackie Chan. <laughs> and I remember watching his earlier stuff, like Rush Hour. That was always mm -hmm. on TV when I was like super young. I just I remember hearing rumors. This is before like Wikipedia like became a thing in elementary, right, or junior high or whatever. But like you know, Jackie Chan has his own stunts and like watching <laughs> him kind of like go underneath railings and do these crazy stunts. Like I always thought that was fascinating. Like how oh, do you yeah. not break bones? And then like going to like your parents be like, when did he break this bone? Do you think he's broken this bone? You know, like it's like the, the game of 20 questions for a stunt that they probably don't even care about at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but, but it, it's its own thing. Like it's, I don't know. It's like more than, the story it, it's it's like a performance it's almost experiencing something superhuman <laughs> in a way yeah uh, in, in real life uh, i don't know it, it was something special but rush hour is some of the american stuff you gotta you gotta watch the old hong kong films man oh i know i know i'm, I'm getting more diverse as i as yeah. i age <laughs> <laughs> well good yeah. um my favorite stunt movies though uh there's a movie actually called uh the night comes for us. I think it's uh, the same. It's an Indonesian film. Really? Yeah, it's on Netflix. Um, it's brutal and kind of like very bloody and violent, but like the stunt work and camera work is like top notch. That's so ridiculous, ridiculously over the top, like how violent it is. 
<laughs> um, but I mean, that kind of pairs well with I'm like John. Watch it, huh? Yeah, watch it. Watch that. Watch Raid Two. Raid. Um, John Wick. Oh yeah, falls in that same Raid. line. But I think stunt action movies that are the action based that have great stunt work are top notch. Yeah, and when and you have to give it up to like the the new Fast and Furious movies. I mean, a lot of the times they are doing a lot of those 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 things like with those cars. It's pretty like your story's crap, but <laughs> it's pretty fun to watch you tossing cars around like that. I I enjoy the, the BTS more than the actual film sometimes. It's like um, how do they go from stung VCRs to? stopping terrorists they were dvd players okay <laughs> you know we all progress that way and hopefully they go to space in the next one <laughs> it's just i i that's kind of why i want to watch it because i've only seen up to f- i think five. Oh, that was five was my favorite but i'm i lived in puerto rico it was filmed half in puerto rico so um yeah i, I, I knew a lot of the, the places yeah i haven't seen anything after that um I know with Paul Walker's passing, like I feel like that's when it kind of elevated and became like even a bigger franchise than like it probably needs to be. But I kind of want to see where exactly they flipped the switch from going to stealing DVD players to stopping worldwide terrorists in space or whatever. You know, <laughs> uh, it was fa- Fast Five. It, it's when they became the Fast and Furious Avengers. <laughs> it's <laughs> the group up, the big group up, and they have to, you know. And then they threw in the rock. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's, it's the fifth one. That was like Fast and Furious one, the new generation, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 it's kind of a fun movie. I thought uh, the first one has a lot of early techno soundtrack to it. BT is the one who did the the score for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but. I don't know. It's kind of like old school 2000s. Very nostalgic, you know? Did it cut out? It oh, cut out. No. You're talking about techno music and old school 2000s and stuff like that. Oh, I was just talking <laughs> about... How, I like very, that techno stuff. I do too. It's very nostalgic of being in the early 2000s though. Like, that's how you age it is the style of the music and the haircuts, you know? Like, the 2000s have a style. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, I love it. But, um, all right, well, we can start wrapping this up. Um, what, what are your fears of pursuing filmmaking? Um, well, I mean, my biggest fear is it becoming so important to me that I lose what's really important. And I think that's, what's, what's good about COVID nowadays is it kind of taught us to sit back and actually realize what's important because if we don't have our health, it's not like, Oh, well, I can't whine about not being able to make a movie if, if I don't have my health, you know, or if my family's not healthy or things like that. And so um, there's been a number of people in our, uh, in, in film that I know recently who've gotten divorces and stuff like that. And it's just, it's become, I don't know if it comes too much in film or, you know, I don't know anything about their relationships or what, what not, but that would be my biggest fear is I would push myself so hard that it would hurt those people closest to me and I would lose that balance and ultimately lose what's more important to me. I have never heard that response before. I think that's very, that's an interesting outlook. Yeah, but there is a danger. I mean, it just, it's because it's so fun. And especially if you're an actor, you know, you have like showmances where you become that character and then you're like, oh, you're, I don't know, romantically involved with somebody other character and, and it's not real, but it feels real, you know, that type of stuff. Um, It's just, I've seen it happen so much that I, I would hate for that to happen to me. Yeah. I'm not scared of failure. That's the thing is like, immediately you want to say well i make a movie and it doesn't make any money back or or anything like that failures it's just a stepping stone it what helps us get better but i don't want my marriage to fail (laughs) i don't want my family life to fail well i think no i think that's a it's a it's a very interesting viewpoint because like with filmmaking i I think a lot of people kind of view it as like 
oh, you're in it for the money, you know? Oh my gosh, it's a happy, happy Hollywood land, essentially. Yeah. Um, but like, I mean, that's definitely a f- valid fear is, you know, it can ruin marriages. I mean, just look how many celebrities we know, like how many times they have been married and divorced and all the drama that follows with it because it's so public. Yeah. I think, yeah, dude, I think risking a private life would be scary. <laughs> yeah. Take one of those risks that you, you know, kind of have to take a dive, but. When I think this can happen in anything, like if anybody has a craft that they want to pursue, whether it be, yeah. if I wanted to become a professional golfer, I'd have to put in a lot of time. And if I lose that balance, then I'm not working at my marriage or I'm not working at being a better father. I'm working at golf and that, you know, the other things suffer and it could be anything, but I just know I fall into those traps with film because one, it is so fun. Like you have those days when you just leave set and you just want to just hang out with everyone afterwards and just talk and, and wind down because it's just one of the best days, you know? Um, but number one, because it's fun, but number two, it's, it's a lot of work. I mean, we, when we're working on the chosen, it's 12 hour days and you had 45 minute commutes down there. So those were, you know, close to 13 and a half hour days. You're working on that thing for 40 days straight, not straight. Sorry. We had weekends off. So um, the chosen, is that what they're filming in Utah? They were filming in Utah. And now it's going back to Texas to, f- to film the rest of season two. That's cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, how many episodes are in a season? Like 10? Eight. Eight. Are they like an hour long each? Yep. That's cool. I saw that has a high IMDb rating. I think that's very neat. Well, it's been rated very, very well. And the fun part is I kind of get to see how they brand and market Jesus. <laughs> Dedicated to, you know, worshiping <laughs> yeah. Jesus and for them to be able to just say, hey, we're going to raise character. You know, there's, there's a lot of moral issues with that too, but they were all super super genuine about what they were doing and it wasn't just um nothing was about the money it was about the message and that's what i really liked about it yeah it all comes back down to the intent yeah it does i think intent i think intent speaks volume man (laughs) if you don't have the if you don't have the best intentions what do you receive from it you know yeah if you don't fall if you don't uh fell yeah um (laughs) And how do you hope you can inspire others? Um, I mean, I'm not young. I'm starting this when I'm when I'm older. Um, but I you're, I, you're you're 29. Don't lie. Yeah, right. You never share your age in show business. You, <laughs> I'm over 18. Okay, that's all you need. To know. <laughs> um, I'm not young. I'm getting started later, but um, I'm hoping to inspire others by by showing them that. There, if they have a story to tell, there's a way to tell it. Whether it be making a stupid movie with your kids and raising money for Make-A-Wish or whether it be um, you know, making yourself act in a movie that you feel like nobody else was right for. Um, if you have a story to tell, there's a way to do it. But if you want to do it right, you got to work first. <laughs> yeah. But you're you're not wrong, and that kind of goes into my next question: is like, what's one piece of advice you would offer? But I think that kind of covers it, unless you have a different piece of advice. Well, yeah, my advice is just try try and put your position in in ways to fail. Essentially, give yourselves opportunities to fail, um, because then you're really going to learn. Because all a professional is is someone who knows how to troubleshoot, right? I always learned professional was, oh, it's someone who gets paid for a job. I mean, really, that is what it is. But when I look at all these professionals in Hollywood, if something goes wrong, they know how to fix it. A professional plumber, if something goes wrong, he knows how to fix it. That's the difference between an amateur and professional. So if you have crossed all of those before, like when you're making 12 shorts in a year, you you won't be surprised later when it comes up. And, and that will add to your prof- professionality, professionalism. <laughs> <One of those. laughs> 
no, I think I, I, I love this analogy of having kind of having to fail to improve. And I, I think just being human, there's a sphere of being failures, you know, and being, we become so complacent and stuck essentially. But um, like you said, like a plumber knows how to plumb mm-hmm. because he's faced it before. Or, uh, a, a cook knows how to like even out the seasoning because he's had to do it before, you know, like yep. there's, yeah, that's exactly what it is. And filmmaking is just lots of problem solving. Um, mm-hmm. Lots of problem solving. <laughs> Nonstop. <laughs> Even when you sleep, problem solving. <laughs> that is true. You got to figure out how to wake up the next morning, even on time. And <laughs> I know. And like you mentioned, like hanging out with crew members afterward, and like you, you could shoot like 12, 13 hours and it could be like an all nighter. And afterward, you're just like, yeah, let's hang out, even though call time's at like two o'clock in the afternoon or whatever, you yeah. know. <laughs> you still just want to kind of process what you just experienced. And there's something special about it. There is. And like, I don't know about you, but for me, like whenever I come home from a set, I always have a hard time sleeping. Uh, my, my, my brain is just like turned on. It's just like going, 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 you know, and uh, that's not even just from like directing or writing. I mean, it's just from just being on set in general, just because it's fun energy. Yeah, 100 percent. And I traditionally am always D.I.T. Um, because I usually edit everything I do or edit other things people do. Um, so I always upload the footage, you know, that's, that's always a treat to just kind of reminisce through the day, um, looking at dailies and, and just making sure it's all there safe and backed up. I love it. And there's nothing, there's so, so, something really very magical about watching the raw footage. And then um, when you're putting together like a rough cut, and seeing how they the the scenes kind of inter, intersect or like how the actors are playing off each other, you know, different takes. Like, it's truly magical. Did, did I cut out again? I can't hear you now. It, it is magical. Oh, you did cut. You did cut out. I heard magical though. Magical is the word. Magical is the word, and that's that's ultimately what draws me to it because it's there. There's such memories that are just ingrained into into one's livelihood even you know making a movie with my kids is is one thing but it's almost like we took a trip to disneyland it's something they're going to remember forever um and and it more more importantly to me it's something i'm going to remember it becomes a part of me and it becomes becomes a part of my legacy you know you will always have night adventure and you'll never you always have that experience with those people there's there's something very magical about that there is. I want to do a feature next. That's my next goal. Well, you've written it, right? <laughs> I've written several. Um, no, I've I've written several. Uh, there, it's kind of interesting. There's some where I'm like, I could totally write this for a low budget, and there's other ones where I'm like, definitely need a higher budget for this. <laughs> yeah. As much as I want to shoot it, there's definitely there has to be money behind that. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I think it's fun. I. I I, don't know. I, I look forward to more of your stuff. I've seen some of your stuff, by the way, and I've, I've had a good time with it. Yeah. What, what have you seen? <laughs> I don't know. I, it's stuff on Facebook, like stuff that's sh- shared on Facebook. And, um, oh, yeah. I've, I've watched some of your stuff, though, and like Newton Productions, that's your company, right? Yeah, it's Newton to Newton. Yeah, yeah. Like that, Stockton to Malone. Yeah, that <laughs> seeing that pop up, like it it clicked when, when uh, we reached out to each other. I'm like, Oh my God, I've actually, <laughs> Oh, this guy. I've actually watched stuff. Some of this stuff. Yeah. 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 I try and mark myself. Okay. On Facebook. <laughs> I think you do a fine job at it. a lot. Yeah. Well, I hope so. It's a little daunting for people to see how much stuff I am doing sometimes, but Facebook is, is a liar. I mean, most of the, most of the days I just sit home and edit all by myself. Yeah. And- you, sh- you share all the good photos at once. Like, yeah. uh-huh, I've been sitting on these for a while. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, um, all right. Well, where can people find you, Cody? Well, um, newton to newtoncom is my website. If they want to go to Instagram, it's newton to newton If they want to go to Facebook, it's newton to newton Productions. You can find my stuff on Amazon. Go look up uh, No Daddy Daughter Dance. That's the one I'm most proud of recently. 
And that's the one that you you acted in with your your kids, that right? That is the one I acted in with my daughter. Yep. I think everybody should check that out. That sounds very fascinating. Well, it's a fun little eighteen minute movie, but it's very family heartwarming type like movie. So if you're looking for horror, go look up another movie. <laughs> I do have some horror on there though. I've done four horror movies and it's not my genre, but they are fun to make and I've really enjoyed making them. They're so fun to make. I love, like you said, the blood squibs and stuff and oh, seeing yeah. how, all the makeup work and action. Yeah. <laughs> the moodiness. We need, we need more Atmos. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I have so much Atmos in all of my films. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. Well, check out Cody's stuff. Um, you can, uh, I was going to say, can people follow you on Twitter or Instagram? But I'm not really on Twitter. They can definitely follow me on Instagram. There you go. Instagram, Facebook, check out his website. Check out his stuff on Amazon Prime. Do it. Is it on Prime or is it just on Amazon? It's on Prime. It's Prime. Free on Prime. There you have it. Um, follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram. I Yeah. And uh, that's all I got. That's all she wrote, awesome. Cody. <laughs> well, this is a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. No, thank you for, for coming on, man. I, I hope you have fun on a Tuesday night. It's a fun Tuesday night for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited for you to uh, overcome COVID and go out there and, and get some stuff done. Let me know when you are. I'll come help you. Dude, I will. I, I'll definitely do that. I'm, ex- I'm excited. I'm just... I will say this, as I've said before in previous um, episodes, is that I'm excited to see what comes from COVID. There's going to be a whole movement of films coming out. They're all going to have similar themes or like new new ideas about similar themes. You know, like I'm excited. I, I'm excited to see what people have been working on during this this time that we've had a weird break so <laughs> but de- i definitely think it's the it's going to be a surge of the indie film where instead of having 130 people work on a cast or on a crew it's going to be seven yeah and you're going to get some of the same results you know it's going to be crazy for people and it's going to be sad for a lot of people who work in the industry because they're going to notice oh they don't need 17 grips you know all they need is apparently a sony camera that has 18 stops of dynamic range they don't have to worry about diffusing anything you know crazy stuff like that yeah well and like just looking throughout film history even like a lot of when when independent cinema comes out it seems like it's always during like a huge transitional in the phase you know like they do it first and then hollywood kind of catches on to it and kind of exploits that thing Mm -hmm. but it seems like it's always independent cinema and like these smaller films that are that under that, yeah they're underground but they do push it and they kind of carry the weight of hollywood on their own shoulders you know what i mean like mm-hmm. take it back and so i'm excited and i'm excited to see what you've been working on and i'm excited to see see you actually finish a project that you want to do so yeah we're good let's work together sometime absolutely sir um thank you for coming on and i will talk to you soon all right bye, bye.